Go ahead. Здравствуйте. Good afternoon. Uh, да, меня зовут Джон. Я говорю по-русски как молодой маленький ребенок. So I'm going to be delivering the presentation in English. Uh, so maximizing fun, the gamer DNA model explained. What is fun? What is the gamer DNA model? So this is something that we developed at GameTree, uh, essentially as a way to analyze games, to understand what are the different kinds of fun in a game. And this is useful for you if you're a game designer so that you can analyze your game with a framework to understand what is it about your game that you're optimizing, what should you be advertising, what features should you be developing, or if you're a gamer and not a designer, it's useful to know this as well, because then you can start to play the games that you like the most, and you can avoid spending time and money on games that you don't know and that you don't like. Uh, an example in myself is uh, Far Cry and The Witcher are games that I've bought twice spent about 10 hours each on in games that I didn't like. And that was before developing this model. Now I know that while I like stories, for example, they aren't the reason I personally play games. And each of you probably has your own different sort of palette for what you consider fun. So now I'm going to go into a bit about what this model is like and so that you can start just enhancing it and applying it in your own life as a designer or as a gamer. So we'll go over an overview of uh, what is this framework. Um, we'll take a look at the model itself. And then we'll go into some discoveries that we've had. Because at GameTree, what we do is we connect gamers with games, with other players, with gaming sessions. We have psychology tests. We have this gamer DNA model. And we have a lot of data that we've analyzed. And we know what are the kinds of fun that go well together, what are kinds of fun that don't go well together that you could apply in your companies. Then I'll go into a little bit of history of where this gamer model came from, because there were preceding models that we sort of built off of, and I'll teach you a little about those, and those might be interesting to research as well for yourselves. And then Q&A. So starting off, what is fun? Uh, from a game development point of view, you have these mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics. And this was developed by a framework called the Aesthetics of Play that was developed by a lot of the most famous game designers in the world. And starting off, you have the mechanics. A mechanic could be something like walking speed and acceleration. There are very little things. And the reason this is important to know about in game design is because as a game designer, a game developer, all you have control of are the mechanics. But as a gamer, the thing that you actually experience is the combination of what all the mechanics turn into, and that's the aesthetics. So the mechanic could be like walking speed, and then dynamic would be combining that with uh, jumping and different sorts of mechanics to make a movement system. And then the aesthetic would be, uh, is it challenging? Is using this movement to jump on platforms, for example, how all this combines, is this something that's fun? And so as a game designer, it's very easy to get lost in the details and not know what is actually fun because you're so used to what you're doing. But by having a framework like this, you can keep in mind your target and you know what to advertise and what to optimize in your game and be clear about what kinds of fun your game is for. Uh, so a bit about the Game Tree model itself. Again, it's the Game Tree app is live. It's something on iOS, Android, and web. And it uses AI to help gamers discover friends and games. Players get matched by this kind of fun that they like. You don't want to match a competitive player with a casual player, for example, because they're not going to have that much fun playing together. And then also what we do is we analyze your games, and we look at uh, what are the different kinds of fun that exists in it based on the kinds of people who rate the game. What are they like? And it imposes it. And actually, uh, I have a bunch of these flyers you can pick up later, where if you're an indie developer or any game developer, you could actually submit your games to our database, and then a lot of people can discover it for free where we'll use AI to match the perfect players with your game based on the kinds of fun that your game delivers. So if you go to gametree.me slash app, or gametree.me slash indie.html, uh, then you can submit your game there, and I have information about that here. So uh, and then again, also later on, we'll be providing insights as well, where you can actually see the mechanics, not just have to theorize about them, but we'll probably make this free and publicly available soon. Uh, if you submit your game, you can get a lot of data on what are the kinds of fun that the gamers like about it. So this is the model itself. And again, this was built on the shoulders of a lot of other people, researchers and game designers. Uh, there'll be another picture of this later if you guys want to take a picture with your phone or something, though I believe this talk will be posted online. 
So I uh, actually skipped action in the slides, but action is essentially about excitement and mechanical skills. I'll just talk through these and then a lot of uh, interesting findings that we've had from analyzing data. But uh, excitement and mechanical skills. So excitement is uh, explosions. It's a lot of action. It's things that, um, that give you adrenaline, fast-paced emotions, whereas mechanical skills could be uh, twitch reflexes, timing jumps, shooting, and when you combine these together, you get the action aesthetic. You could have either one of these, they don't have to go together, but they tend to go together on average, and so we combine that into action. Next we have strategy. Uh, strategy, we have complexity, uh, which is many rules, a high learning curve, and having a lot of depth. A complex game are like the paradox games, like uh, Europa Universal is, or maybe the Total War games, where there's just a lot of rules. And some people really like the complexity, other people hate it. So in your game, it's good to know how complex are you aiming for. If you have a very casual style, and it's gonna appeal to kind of casual gamers, maybe you don't have too much complexity. Whereas critical thinking is combined with complexity to make strategy, but it's more about strategic decisions, uh, foresight, analysis. An example of a game that uses a lot of critical thinking but is not very complex would be like chess, where there's actually a lot of strategy but you don't have a lot of complexity. So these don't always have to exist together, but commonly they do. Uh, next is challenge. So if you have a challenging game, or if this is one of your core aesthetics, uh, difficulty is often one aspect, which is usually just people pushing their limits and having to try again and again to succeed. Some people like this a lot, some people don't, but it's good to be mindful of how much challenge, if it's high, low, medium, that you go for. Most games in general have about half of these aesthetics. Don't try to do everything because it's gonna be a waste of resources, a waste of marketing. Really pick the things that are for your audience and really double down on those. And if you look at a lot of the most popular games though, the AAA games, they're actually companies that tend to deliver on a lot of these aesthetics very well, but it's very difficult to do without a AAA budget, a ton of time, uh, and a huge team. So the other aspect of challenge is practice, and some people like practicing things, some don't, but if people are spending time watching replays, or if they are just doing exercises, like in StarCraft, for example, they have training missions. StarCraft is a high challenge game, it's very micro-intensive, and so a lot of the people who play that end up doing a lot of practice. Uh, competition is the next aesthetic, and that's composed of dominance and status. Dominance is about proving that you're better than other people. Uh, it could be through beating a lot of players who are worse than you and getting a feeling of gratification. Um, it's about power, influence, and then status is close but not quite the same. Dominance is the innate feeling of being powerful. Co status is uh, seeing your name on the leaderboard or knowing how you rank in different uh, places. So if you have a game that's very competitive, then often it's a good idea to include a leaderboard or even if it's just a single player game, what you could do is compare how quickly did the person beat the game or how few turns did they beat the game compared to other players because this is something that will be very appealing to players. It could add a lot of replayability where if they're not being compared to anything then players might lose interest after playing it once but if they know that they scored like the fifth best of all time or in the top 5% they could play again to see if they'll do better. Fellowship is uh, pretty related to competition ironically. They're both a bit more on the social spectrum of players engaging but whereas competitive is conflict, fellowship is working together. And teamwork is a part of this. It's about getting together. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons is a very popular teamwork game. A lot of RPGs where you have a different group of people who kind of have to work together in their special roles to achieve a bigger objective. And then socializing is another aspect. Uh, World of Warcraft is very popular where a lot of people go in and they'll just chat. Uh, and so with this, if you have a fellowship game, it, maybe it's good to include a lot more chat features. Uh, ways that people can create parties, uh, maybe forums or things to supplement the game or ways people can add each other as friends. Completion uh, is about achievement and grinding. So if you have an achieve a completion game uh, and this achievement aesthetic, that's a lot of badges, collectibles, things like that. Uh, it's, it's good to, if this is really something you're aiming for, if this is something that you're using as a selling point on your game, then you could make tons of achievements because these certain kinds of people are a lot more triggered. This is why they play games. Other people really don't care at all. And then grinding is a part of completion as well. For example, Diablo, uh, getting items. Some people like this, some people don't. But grinding and completion are very popular in casual games where you get a lot of uh, reward for spending time on a system, getting more resources over time. Uh, next up we have discovery. And discovery is actually one of the most popular aesthetics on the Game Tree app. 
uh, from our community. Because we're about 50,000 people right now, I assume that you have more early adopters who are more discoverers, so it's biased. But this, in general, we found in our data to be very popular. So discovery is about autonomy, having freedom of choice, and having a lot of different paths that you can take in the game. And then there's also exploration, which is like a roguelike game where you constantly are regenerating the map. Um, there's a lot of diverse kinds of activities people can do, a lot of things essentially to discover. Next is aesthetics. And aesthetics, as you can guess, is graphics. Uh, graphics are kind of broken down into two types. There's one that's more about realism and one that's more about a unique art style. And if uh, there's also thematic relevance, does it fit a theme? Uh, and having attention to detail can also be a part of the, the aesthetics of graphics. And then sound itself, um, you can have atmospheric sound, voice acting, effects, music. Uh, different people care a lot about the sound. Some people play a game because of the soundtrack. Some people really don't care. I know artists personally who the primary reason they pick a game is because of the graphics. Um, now, I believe this is the last, or two more. So expression uh, is artistic creativity, having a lot of variety of options and uniqueness. If you're designing a game where it's, let's say, a, like a challenge strategy game, usually that's not something for expression. So don't invest in making a character editor if you're not really positive that's something that people are going to like. It's probably better to double down on other stuff. Alongside artistic creativity is role play, uh, immersion, make believe, choose your own adventures. Again, Dungeons and Dragons and role playing games are a really good example of this. And we have story. So stories are a combination of the characters, the people in the story, and the world that takes place, and then the drama that ensues. So characters, uh, you, if you have a story game, then invest a lot into making memorable characters, unique characters. With lore, uh, it's a backstory, world building, history setting. Skyrim's an example of a game that has really big lore. All the different games start, share a world, but the characters aren't necessarily quite as well developed in that. So now I'm gonna share with you some of the findings that we've had based on analyzing the data of different kinds of cluster samples of what, where these exist together. So if you're a developer or a gamer, you can kind of look for these together and you know that you're more likely to find something that's a hit. So the first one is that story, aesthetics, and expression go together. Uh, an example could be um, like Skyrim, again, where they have a very robust character builder. People like playing with lots of uh, screenshots and a lot of different characters and different playthroughs to experience different kinds of things. Uh, there's a lot of story in Skyrim, and there is a lot of room for, I guess in the aesthetics, it's known for having great graphics and uh, tons and tons of mods to improve these things. Another finding is that competition and challenge go very well together. So if you have a challenging game, something like Dark Souls, adding in like a leaderboard it could be a good idea for something to engage players. And another finding we had is that those previous two categories actually are at odds with each other. So if you have a game that has story, aesthetics, and expression, it's not a good idea to mix that with competition and challenge, at least if your goal is to make a game that a lot of people will like and play. Uh, because those sorts of aesthetics in general are in different kinds of people, where the kinds of people who care about one group tend not to care about the other group. Another finding is that competition does not get along very well with discovery. If you think about competitive games, they're usually uh, very focused on player versus player action, whereas discovery tends to be more of like a player exploring the world or the environment or mechanics in the system. So those don't really go that well together. So don't necessarily uh, introduce competitive elements into a discovery game. And discovery does go well, though, with completion. And this is pretty obvious, but a game where you have a lot of places to explore, give people badges for finding things. Because those players who like exploring like badges, and people who like badges like exploring. So do consider adding those if you haven't already. Discovery also goes well with fellowship. If you look at a lot of games, for example, Eldritch Horror, uh, it's kind of a discovery game. It's a board game where you have a lot of cards and you're kind of discovering the world. And so people in groups like to go out and explore and do things together. Dungeons and Dragons, again, is a very good discovery fellowship game because it's about a people going out into the world and exploring together. So this original framework is the aesthetics of play that we built on. And it was developed by a few famous game designers together where they published a paper on it. And this is essentially what they'd come up with as the original categories that we expanded into 20 different sub-aesthetics. 
And then here's a gamer motivational model, which was another inspiration for us with GameTree when we were creating this new model. This was created by Quantic Foundry, and they have an interesting blog if you want to check that out. Uh, also, GameTree itself has a blog where we publish some information. Um, and again, they have some stuff here. Uh, I personally found that it didn't quite have enough information displayed, and not a lot of these necessarily added up together. Uh, for example, mastery, um, challenge, and strategy. Challenge also goes well with action, challenge. Um, so it, it, I didn't think that they'd necessarily fit together too well uh, all the way. So we made some modifications and had to make our own model. Uh, here again is the full picture. If you guys want to take a picture, uh, maybe it'd be fun to analyze yourself, think about your own tastes and comparing to games, if there's something you're on the fence about buying before you spend uh, 1,000 grivna or five minutes torrenting something. And, uh, and then uh, also in the Game Tree app, if you download that, it's one word Game Tree, you can also take a gamer DNA test where we sort of give you your pro taste profile. Uh, so some more resources, if you're interested in this, is we have a video of this lecture with a lot of animations, memes, things like that. Uh, so this is the name of the video right here if you want to watch that or reference it later. Uh, we also have a wiki on the Game Tree website where we go into the gamer aesthetics and then we also have a lot of gamer personas and archetypes. So being able to know what are the kinds of archetypes of your fans. Those archetypes map out a lot to the gamer aesthetics but only have so much time in this talk to cover stuff. And then we have the uh, Game Tree app itself if this is interesting for you to uh, find games, we have a recommendation engine where we sort reviews by how similar people are to you based on tastes in similar games and the user DNA. Uh, and then we also show predicted ratings as well with 93% accuracy. And again, if you're a developer, find me later and I'll give you one of these. It has instructions on how to submit your game to the Game Tree database where a lot of people can discover it for free. Uh, so with that said, I'm happy to answer questions either in general or about your game. Um, I think it's good to get some stuff going back and forth so you guys can see how to apply this stuff in different sorts of use cases. Yes. Okay. Huh. It is challenge. <laughs> Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you for a speech. Do you speak Russian? No. Okay. I will uh, ask in English. So me and my friend, we are making RPG game, and we have like separate visions of our game. I would like to add more features, and he would like to add more stories. How do we decide uh, where to go? Uh, so one thing I want to say about RPGs is RPGs are a huge genre. They're like the biggest genre out of everything. You could have RPGs that are about action. You could have RPGs that are about strategy, ones that are about story, expression, aesthetics. Uh, one thing that I think is bad about the way that people stereotype games and genres is that they don't do a very good job. I think a more accurate way to stereotype games is to pick the aesthetics, the kinds of fun that they deliver on. Um, w when deciding about your game, you haven't released it yet, correct? Uh, so you're deciding on more features versus more story. It depends on the users. Like I would have people play it or think about the target audience. Um, and again, if, you've, if you watch this online, you can see things that like go well together and don't go well together. But if you see the things that have to do with story or other aesthetics that, for example, you want to add features that will support those things. For example, I believe story goes well with expression. So if you want to make a character editor, then that's probably a good feature to add on to. Uh, a lot of it too depends on not just the, the like how good the aesthetics are, but the number of them you have as well. So it, make sure that they're complementing each other, the features, because like story and challenge don't go that well together. Story and competition don't go that well together. So if you're adding a lot more difficulty to a story, uh, those are different kinds of gamers who tend to play those games. Um, so try to stay within the cluster samples and just decide among yourselves who's the target user and what's going to maximize the fun overall in the equation. And also not everybody is going, even though, uh, for example, I mentioned myself that I don't play games for stories, I still love Skyrim because it delivers really well in a lot of other mechanics. So for me that isn't necessarily a part of it that fits well and this could be related to you as well where think about the features and it's just depending on like the breadth and how deep you want to go with them. Another question?
Any more questions? Okay, it's Hi. here. Should I go? Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks for the for the speech. It was really good. Um, I was thinking on when you find that some uh, some things go against other aesthetics. So, for example, story aesthetics and expression go against challenge plus competitive. Yes. However, how, how do you how do you find that? Or uh, basically, we have a lot of data. Yeah. And we're, you have a data scientist go and look at the cluster samples. A cluster sample is like a set of related uh, traits that, you, that appear in the data. And then there's, they're usually highly correlated with each other, but they also tend to be like kind of a, a triangle or some sort of cluster. So basically, um, the story aesthetics expression, these kind of players are kind of there to... Um, and this, I'm not saying that every game that has story, for example, is at odds with competition and challenge, but just on average, those three tend to group together or they tend to conflict with the others. So, so when you're mixing them, do you see like those games becoming less popular or is it just that it it's, tends not to be in those popular games? It's not gonna make the game less popular, yeah. but it's not gonna make the game as strong compared to if you use the same resources on other things. Like if you notice that most, um, like for example, Call of Duty games, Mm. Call of Duty games have really bad stories. Like, nobody ever, I've never even heard anybody talk about a Call of Duty story. Yeah. But, because they're very big on competition and challenge. Uh, so, for them, they choose to invest those resources in those. And it's not really worth it for them to put that much effort into their single player campaigns because that's not why people are playing their games. Yeah. So, if they did that, then they would be spending less time on the reason that people play the games, and then more people would play Battlefield or other games, for example. Yeah. But then StarCraft is really strong on story, competition, and challenge. Oh, that's so. true. Um, but StarCraft doesn't really have much in the way of expression. True. And I wouldn't even call it that strong aesthetics, like mediocre, true. maybe. True. Um, so it's, it's like a cluster, so if you have like all three of those, then especially don't do the other two. But it is okay to mix and match these, uh, but just try to, try to avoid the overlapping the clusters. Okay, cool. I'm hogging the mic here a little bit, but uh, can I do one more question? Oh yeah, I think we have a lot of time, so take cool. your time. Uh, so me and my friends, we've been looking for the perfect MMO for a really long while, uh, mm -hmm. since back in World of Warcraft, and we were big griefers, you know, PvP players. Oh yeah. So we really liked the dominance aspect of the... Um, what was it, the competitive uh, or competition aesthetic, I think it was? Uh, yeah, competition. But what we found was that we really need there to be softcore players as well in these games in order for us to have fun. So we dabbled a bit with Darkfall, for example, which is very hardcore PvP. But what happened then was that when everybody's just all about hardcore PvP, it doesn't become as fun. So we found that we kind of want some sheep as wolves and, and the other way around. Oh, and yeah. that, I guess that kind of goes against when you're trying to always match perfectly even players, you know? Well, there's a, have you heard of Bartle's taxonomy? Nope. Uh, so that's a popular framework that's used for balancing multi massive multiplayer ecosystems. And in that system, there are like hunters, explorers, uh, socializers, and like something else. And the idea is that in different MMOs, you want to have a certain balance of players. Mm -hmm. So an MMO is like a special place because it's not like you're strictly in like a competitive match. It's uh, a lot more social. There's a lot more things to do, a lot of things going on. So these rules aren't going to apply like as straightforward 100% as they would in a game like StarCraft, for example. Yeah. Uh, so in that system, you kind of want to analyze if you're making like a multiplayer game with a big social aspect, what are the, uh, what's a good ratio of people to do different kinds of things? Because again, yeah, you're right. You don't want to always have uh, a bunch of killers, like player killers, because then all the other players are going to leave because they're just getting ganked too much. Yeah. Uh, so that's why it's important to analyze like what are the palettes of the kinds of people in the game, how to balance them. The first Ultima Online, that was the first MMO, uh, it came out and it allowed free PvP like almost everywhere, full loot and everything. And a lot of the players started to leave the game because they were getting frustrated, a lot of noobs. So they ended up having to create a world that was kind of safer to balance the player bases to create the most fun play experience. And those competitive players, yeah, you're right, they do get fun out of ganking more casual players. But, and the casual players like a little bit of fun of having the risk involved of like, yeah, being in danger. But, I think so too. Yeah. It's also going with, the, with play styles. Like in poker, for example, it's really important that you don't have everybody playing the same pay, play style, even though you're not talking to each other. It's important that you know there's a mix, so I think it yeah. applies to yeah. You don't want everybody going all in all the time, or the game exactly. is over immediately, or everybody being a nit, you know, yeah. just not doing anything. Yeah, Thank good, you. Good yeah, so we have a lot of time, so don't hesitate to ask questions. 
So I want to ask about competition versus discovery, and mainly how do they counteract? Uh, why I want to question about this is because competition leads to challenge. Challenge leads to practice, and practice basically includes discovery. You explore the vast majority of information that you have about the game and uh, explore the deepness of game mechanics. Some people try to find fun strategies, some people try to find and discover dominant strategies, so they basically spend time discovering. So, why? Um, so, one thing about discovery here is uh, th that, that kind of stuff that you're mentioning, I would still keep more in like the strategy and uh, challenge bucket. I, I, I don't mean uh, discovery as much here. It's about kind of autonomy is one aspect of it. Uh, being able to have, like, being the hero in your story, being able to decide what happens. Exploration, uh, it's, like, there are diverse activities. It's not necessarily about optimizing the variables, but it's about you being able to go fishing and farming and to be able to, like, make your room and have a house. It's about having a large variety of kinds of things you can do, hidden quests, more NPCs than you could ever talk to or storylines than you could ever explore. So yeah, the good, good clarification is um, if you're making the game, uh, having a lot of advanced strategies, if that, that's not going to conflict with uh, this discovery aesthetic in that way. Hello. Hi. Uh, so you said that you've collected a large amount of data. So is it possible to look at it, or do you have a service for us to just predict which combination of aesthetics would be fine, would be popular? Uh, yes. So. Right now, even as a user, it's available. There's a gamer DNA test that shows some information. Uh, we're, we just started accepting indie game submissions where we'll have a, a special way where users can search specifically for indie games. I think the biggest challenge is not necessarily making the game, but actually getting it discovered when more and more of the market's going to the AAA games and there's more developers. So a lot of this tools to like help you basically get your game discovered and sold so you can make a living doing that stuff. Um, so you could submit those, and then in February, uh, we're going to be releasing a feature where people can search specifically just for indie games, because a lot of people prefer to play indie games, but it's hard when, A, you don't know people who have played the game to, uh, to trust it enough to play it, and also even to know about them in the first place. Then, uh, once we have more ratings on the games, that's when we'll release a tool to give you more insight into what are the, what's the DNA of your game. So you can look at like kind of um, what's the average players like on the application and what is your DNA so you can kind of see what stands out from the average player. And then you know that those are the things that, you're, that your players like. And then you can kind of think about your own game and say like, okay, well if this is the average players who enjoy the game the most, the ones who like it the most, well here's a segment of people who like it a little bit less but maybe they, they have this DNA so maybe I'll add a little something for them. Or maybe the people who like it the most they're like really extreme in like aesthetics or like um, role play, but your game you think is only kind of mediocre in that, so maybe you even want to add more to make those people love it. Uh, okay, so, but uh, if I want to just, uh, when I already have a game, so it, it's rather difficult to change the aesthetics, to change the mechanics, what if I'd like to predict, so uh, to find out which uh, mechanics to choose, which aesthetics to choose prior to development the game? Uh, well, there can always be updates and also marketing and sales, uh, knowing which parts of your game to talk about. Because if you see that maybe you're talking about a couple features of your game, but that the people who are actually playing it are people who are high in another feature, maybe it's more worth it to advertise to those people because I believe that the rate, the reviews, at least for me, are the most important part about buying games. I can almost never buy something with mixed reviews, so it's especially important that you're advertising the right parts of your game and optimizing the kinds of fun for those players. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? No? Oh, here. Okay. Oh. Yeah, we have a. <laughs> Who is there? Oh, it's here. Um, greetings. Uh, when we speak about game and content, we aren't about uh, strategy itself. We can't forget about Twitch, uh, because gamers usually watch game and content uh, not only playing playing it, but also just to watch. And uh, have you ever thought about uh, referring all these findings and all this gaming DNA to the content they um, watch outside of the game? Interesting. Um, one thing that 
I'd like to do with the company in the future is actually to make a recommendation platform for streamers uh, to find out which streamers you should watch based on the, your, your DNA, what, what their play style is. Because the world is getting more and more crowded and I personally believe that more important now than ever is to help people discover like the best choice out of too many choices. Um, so as a streamer, I hadn't actually thought about that little bit yet, but that, that could easily work, is uh, not only referring people to the streamers, the people that you might get along with the best, or they focus on the aspects of the game you like the most and play the same games as you. But actually, yeah, we, we could easily show the streamers, based on, once we have that feature in, that this is the, the DNA of your audience. This is the kind of stuff that they like, just to have awareness of that. But so you're just going to do this. Now you have no reports of some kind. Uh, no, right now the things that we have are uh, the ability to have a personality psychology test and a gamer DNA test, and then to add and rate games across all platforms. We have uh, a couple hundred thousand games, and they're iOS, Android, um, they're web games, computer games, console games, and even tabletop and board games we have. So it's completely cross-platform. So this is meant to be like sort of a universal solution that hopefully everybody will use as like a tool to navigate the increasingly complex gaming world. Uh, Thank you. But yeah, so yes, being able to discover news would be something that would be nice to do in the future, discover streamers. And even to discover reviewers actually. Something that we do is uh, on the game recommendation page, we look at all the reviews and we've scraped all the reviews from all the most popular games on the internet and then provided links to them, created personas for the authors, and then compare your DNA to the reviewer and we sort the reviews by who is the most similar to you at correlated stuff so you know who to trust. And I think that's especially good for indie games because with an indie game you don't know am I similar to the people who like this or not, so hopefully Game Tree is going to create a lot more trust that actually results in a lot more purchases. Aye. So I have a data science background, so I'm just gonna ask some, some questions about whether you thought about expanding this into a direction where you would find out um, which combinations of mechanics would be the most profitable or least, least used but most profitable. For example, if you included data from Steam Spy or something about tags and then splitting the tags into similar uh, mechanic style uh, combinations like here and then, and then linking them to the clusters. Uh, do you mean mechanics or the types of fun, the aesthetics? Types of fun. Sorry. Okay. Um, yes, eventually in the long term, uh, it's not our biggest priority, uh, but that is like eventually it'd be nice to be able to pursue all the different options with the data. Um, but yeah, that, that, that could be something good. And we'd probably work with another research firm because a lot of companies have actually even mechanics, not just types of fun, but being able to tie these together, you could probably get even more data because this information is pretty abstract. It's not something that you can just take and like feed. This is information that you have to kind of think about and like philosophize, ask customers, think about what you're doing. Um, but I think in the future we could tie that to actual mechanics as well, themes, um, number of players, features, things like that. Yeah, so it could be available as like a dashboard. Um, before then, we'd probably do some consulting uh, just by being able to mine our database before it's scalable. Of course, so. Any more questions? Like... All right, thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for great speech. And uh, if you guys want one of the uh, things up here to list your games in the database, uh, then that could help get it more discovered. So feel free to meet me or ask questions around the conference. Thanks.